Thank, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I, I should explain a little bit um, here about why, why I'm here today. Uh, I was in fact invited uh, to come and talk uh, here in this very hall, I think, um, in September, but I wasn't well uh, and, and couldn't come. And very nicely, I was asked back to, to speak now, which might explain why I come from a slightly different direction from most of the people probably in this room, uh, in that uh, my, what I'd like to do is to give you an idea of the, the motivation uh, for my trying to use a computer to do musicology and, and, and how um, what I've learnt um, over really some decades, I'm not going to say how many, um, I've learnt about what might be or might not be um, useful uh, to myself and other people in the future. Okay, so first of all, I, I'm going to talk about me for quite a, quite a chunk of this. Um, I hope that doesn't sound too um, arrogant, but uh, I think you'll see that it gives you an idea of... Um, oh, by the way, I, I, I just want to be quite clear about one thing. When I say musicology, I mean it in the, in the, the UK sense of all kinds of deep study of music. That includes music analysis, uh, which is treated as a separate discipline on this side of the pond. Um, but we include that, and, we, and I also uh, include in this general, let's call it a remit of musicology, I would include ethnomusicology. I don't make a separation between those. They're all about the deep study of music in some sense. So about myself, uh, as long ago as the late 60s, I made a full start in science. I tried to do a physics degree. I wasn't good enough at mathematics. Um, so I took up the lute. And actually, uh, <laughs> that's a kind of weird thing to say, but um, I dropped out in the famous year 1968, um, when lots of it was very fashionable to do that kind of thing. Um, um, if you ask your parents about this, they, they will confirm that. Um, um, and then I worked in an antiquarian bookshop. Now, that's another weird thing to do. Um, the, the place looked like this. Um, sorry, that's a very bad, old, even older photograph. That was the, where this... It's, it's actually a very famous uh, antiquarian bookshop in, uh, in London. Uh, it was founded in the mid-19th century, and uh, oh, they, they've sold virtually every old book that you've ever heard of, including Gutenberg Bibles. They've sold several of those. Um, but I, I got a little job there, and while I was there, I got a thorough grounding as part of my training uh, for the job that, that was basically selling books in bibliography, uh, which I absolutely don't regret because I learned more than probably you would learn in a, a conventional university course on, say, musicology. Um, in 1971, I went to the Royal College of Music because by then I'd realized that um, there were the opportunities to learn to play my instrument properly. And the person I studied with was, was a, a, a dear lady called Dinah Poulton. Uh, and that's a picture of her at about that time. But in the 1920s, she looked like this and was a rather glamorous figure. Um, but a real pioneer of this instrument, this strange instrument, which you can't actually very well see in that um, reproduction, but uh, you'll see more pictures of lutes in a minute. Uh, she was the biographer and editor of the lute works of John Dowland, who is probably the most famous composer for the lute, uh, certainly to English-speaking people. Uh, she wrote a, a book about him, and there's this uh, collection of his solo lute music, which was, of course, transcribed... Uh, it, it's, well, I'll talk about the notation in a moment. I'm not going to talk about it in great detail, but it's important to understand something about it. Um, he, she was a former student of Arnold Dolmetsch, who was a great pioneer in the historical performance of music, that is, uh, performance which takes account of the way uh, the documents, uh, included printed uh, documents, tell us a, um, it should be performed at any particular period. Um, and here's a picture of him with two members of his family, him, him playing the lute, that's Arnold Dolmetsch, uh, and that's Rudolf Dolmetsch, who died during World War II, and his sister Cecile um, singing. Okay, so more. Of course, in 1970s, there was 
it, it, there, were, there wasn't a huge amount of lute music published, to be absolutely honest. We had to find our own. Uh, it meant that we either copied music from manuscripts. So you, you could get Xerox copies in those days, they, but they weren't tremendously easy to, to get from libraries and things. But, of course, once um, one had printed something out from, from a microfilm, for instance, you could copy it uh, on a Xerox machine and send it to your friends. But it was a pretty laborious process. Uh, a very much a manual process. Um, and, of course, you had to prepare a performing edition from an original source, um, and you had to investigate the background because you, you didn't want to um, uh, mislead your audience by saying things in your program notes that were, were irrelevant or uh, misleading. And, of course, we were very conscientious about these things in the early days of the early music revival, as, it was, uh, as it's become to be known. Um, and this providing of a historical concept, uh, context for programs, um, I think together these constitute something pretty close to what I think of as musicology. Um, it may not have been a formal um, uh, training as a musicologist, uh, but uh, it, it, the, the background was very similar. And the whole time it had practical aim, that is to get the music understood by an audience. Um, it's always been very important to me to communicate that mu music to an audience. And I would say that the discipline of musicology is coming round to that view now. It's not, thought, it's not really a dry academic discipline which is somehow detached from the process of performance, which it used to be, it has to be admitted. And we all had to do it. All of those of us who were performing um, in, in this, uh, uh, this sort of slightly pioneering uh, period of um, historical uh, performance, uh, we had to do the same sort of thing. The lute, well, I, I, I don't want to labor this too much, but to, between the 15th and the 18th centuries, you could say that it was as familiar a part of the musical scene as the piano was in the 19th century, let's say. Uh, it was absolutely the instrument that uh, most uh, composers, for instance, would have been able to play a few tunes on it. And we know that, for instance, Palestrina, uh, who was one of the most famous composers of the 16th century, famous for choral music and for, for great polyphony, um, he, he uh, actually tried out music on, on his lute uh, before he... Um, it's sent it to the publisher, as far as I understand it. I don't, I don't know the full details. I'm sure I could be corrected about that if it's not, not the case. But there are plenty of other famous composers who left no lute music as such, who we know played the lute. Uh, Gesualdo is another famous example. He was, he was rated a very, uh, very good performer on the lute, but being a prince, he, um, he didn't um, admit to... Uh, he, well, he didn't need to earn a living doing it, so he didn't need to sell books of lute music. Um, okay, the lute, I think you've probably all seen images of the lute, even if you don't know the instrument, but here's an example. Uh, I'm going to show you four examples by, fame, by great uh, painters uh, from different periods. Um, those four, they have one thing in common apart from the lute, actually, um, which is the thing that I'm most interested in. They're all playing from books of music. And... Those are what I'm interested in. Uh, it's the, it, it's the, the sources of music that people played from. The, uh, um, the, the, you will n note one thing about all these books, um, as far as we can tell from the actually rather poor images in this case. Uh, none of them are written in lute tablature, which I'll introduce to you to in a minute. Uh, they're all standard notation, which is not what we normally associate the lute with. Um, sorry, that'll become clearer in a minute. Uh, but that's an interesting fact, that the painters painted them playing from uh, ordinary music notation, which any musician would have understood. There are exceptions to that. There are some paintings which show lute tablature um, uh, very clearly um, illustrated. Music for the lute, well, there are tens of thousands of surviving pieces. Um, but on the whole, it's pretty badly un known and understood by people who don't actually play the instrument. Uh, okay, th there are ex exceptions to that. And um, obviously, there are a lot of recordings now. This, this is possibly 
uh, a little bit out of date, this, this uh, statement here. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of survival from talks I've given about loop music over the years. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's not well known, and of course one of the um, symptoms of that is that uh, recordings, for instance, tend to pass on a repertory which is based on previous recordings. So you get this very interesting phenomenon of um, a student playing their teacher's repertoire and so on. Uh, that, there were two reasons for that. Uh, one is that that's the, the cause of least action. I mean, it's, it's the easiest thing to do. Um, especially in the days when there wasn't very much published, you would actually get from your teacher uh, the, uh, the piece that they've just played and they'd hear my boy, you can practice this, use my fingering and so on. Um, that's that, uh, but also it, it's, it's, it's part of a, a, a kind of process which I believe happened uh, in the, from the beginnings of the, 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 the lute um, being notated, uh, the, the lute music being written down, that people passed around the music and of course certain pieces would get passed around more than others, but the, the ones that were more popular. And this is one of the things that I'm really interested in one day trying to find out more about. That is, can we use um, technology to help us see patterns of transmission of, these, of pieces across sources, across geographical regions, uh, across time? And I think uh, it doesn't take much thought to realize that the modern technology gives us really interesting opportunities in this direction. So that's one of the motivations for, for getting involved with computers. Loop music is nearly always uh, notated in this system called tablature, and I'll show you just some examples. Uh, I'm not going to explain the details, but th it's, it's interesting to see what they look like. Here's a little snippet of Italian tablature, as we call it, from 1546, then a bit of French tablature from 1551 a bit of German tablature from uh, about a generation earlier. Um, I'm not going to explain the difference, but just be aware that they look very different, but they're all telling you the same thing. And, that, and some, that's printed music on the left. On the right, a couple of examples of manuscripts, one from Italy from the, the end of the 16th century, and one from France from the end of the 17th century. And the music goes on right into the 18th century, I was lucky enough recently to, to, um, to actually identify, I think for the first time, uh, from actually from very nice uh, digital copies. I was sent from Nuremberg a manuscript uh, which had I'd previously known from microfilm. Uh, it's from the late 18th century, and uh, I I was kind of puzzled by the fact that there seemed to be some music in this which was much later than the period of the manuscript. And I didn't quite believe this. Um, and so I was trying to work out, and I thought, oh, well, if I can get color images from the, from the uh, library, that would be much better. Now, of course, when I, got my, when I had my microfilm 30 years ago, um, they only photographed the pages which had music on them. They didn't photograph the empty pages. But of course, the photographer made the choice of which were the empty pages. What he didn't photograph were the pages where very faintly, in pencil, some extra music had been written in. He didn't notice it because it's very, very faint. But it appeared in these, these color uh, digital prints. I was sent only uh, images. I was sent only only last year, and sure enough, on one of these fo folios, which I'd never seen before, and actually I'd. In the 1970s, I'd looked at that manuscript and I hadn't noticed it. So it shows you, uh, you know, a, a good digital photograph can sometimes tell you things you didn't even know when you had the mic uh, when the man manuscript was in front of you. Um, there was a piece which I recognised. It was, in fact, Papageno's aria from the Magic Flute, which is 1791. So, so this a pen pencil sketch in tablature for the lute of an aria by Mozart. So it shows you how long this tradition went on. And of course, the tradition goes on today. Here's a little bit, I just wanted to show you a snippet, just to remind you it's exactly the same system, well, with some, some differences. Um, what what uh, guitarists tend to refer to as tabs on the internet. This, this, 
don't worry about what it is. It's actually a, a transcription of a little bit of um, Thelonious Monk. I mean, it's completely irrelevant what the music is. But I just wanted to show you that, that this exactly the same system is used throughout the 19th century in notating um, flamenco music in Spain. It was called chifras, or chifras, is it? I don't know. I'm not a Span Spaniard. Um, but uh, this tablature system has never really died since it was invented in the middle of the 15th century. Um, almost always notated in tablature, which needs, of course, to be trans transcribed into staff notation for humans to analyze. Um, and it needs, it, sorry, it needs to be transcribed for those who wish to analyze, except for players <laughs> who even now prefer tablature. I don't know whether a PowerPoint slide is supposed to be grammatical, but anyway. <laughs> um, there are good practical reasons for that. It's a prescriptive notation. It's not a descriptive one. It tells the player what to do with his or her fingers. It doesn't describe to the reader what is in the music. Uh, it doesn't tell you this is a, uh, a B flat. Um, it just says, play this uh, put your finger on this fret and play this note at this moment. And it uses a letter or a number code, um, not completely unlike um, a computer program. I don't want to go into that analogy in great detail, but uh, uh, it means that it's very easy to encode loop music for uh, a computer. Um, now, of course, computers came along uh, as far as individuals were concerned in the, I suppose, about the 1980s. Uh, and the potential was always obvious to me, but I held off buying a computer until 1967 because, ironically, in retrospect, I didn't want to have to program. Because, uh, quite honestly, before that, you really had to be serious about it. You had to learn basic or Fortran or one of those codes, to, uh, um, sorry, um, programming languages, and had to write things which were inimical to someone like myself, I thought. Um, the Apple Mac seemed to be the answer, and, and the one I bought was really state-of-the-art. It had a 20 megabyte hard drive, and that was uh, big enough to hold the text of an encyclopedia of lute and guitar that I'd been commissioned to write. Uh, fortunately, it never happened, and it certainly wouldn't have fitted on that 20 megabyte hard drive if I had written it. Um, okay, um, you, you're probably wondering how I ended up with a um, professor in front of my name. Uh, well, it, I got him by the back door, I have to admit this. Um, and it's something that's probably not possible on this side of the Atlantic. Um, it's still vaguely possible uh, in the UK. Um, but I managed to get a grant to work on the lute music of Sylvius Leopold Weiss, as I was introduced uh, about, um, whose edition I had taken over. Um, that had been started by a, a, a friend of mine in California but he'd actually become disenchanted with it, and I, I took it on. Um, and, but simultaneously, I got a little job at King's College London, which has got a, a great uh, music department, which is uh, still going strong. Um, and I, the, my remit was to investigate the usefulness of computers for the music department. Uh, of course, in those days, it, it still wasn't obvious that, um, compute, uh, that music departments should spend a lot of money buying computers. And they were very expensive then, of course. Don't forget that. They've got a lot cheaper. As uh, um, uh, this tends to happen with technology, um, you know, the more, the more it uh, advances, the cheaper it becomes. That's one of the main things that happens. Eventually, I was asked to set up a studio for composers at King's College London. Um, but actually, I was the one who used it. Um, and it was never really used for com composition and all those things. Uh, the, the wonderful work that goes on in places like this um, was, we were thinking of it, but they, di they didn't really hire the right person because I, I'm not a person who does synthesis and um, uh, a lot of effects processing and all that kind of thing. I'm, I'm looking at music from the other direction. Um, and. But uh, anyway, uh, it was great for me, as you can imagine. Um, and, uh, but the other thing I did while I was at 
at, at King's was to work with the Center for Computing in the Humanities, which is now a department of hu um, humanities computing. Uh, we're pretty much pioneers in the UK in that respect. Um, and we formed a little uh, music data research group, as I called it. Um, and this involved people from music, from physics, from electronic engineering, uh, especially audio engineers, um, uh, and computer science. Uh, so I got these people into a room and basically banged their heads together and s to see what would happen. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. Uh, what we never managed to achieve was any kind of official recognition. So um, it, uh, it, but, but it was very fruitful in that we, we actually got together and uh, started research projects and things like that and got some funding together and then eventually dispersed to other institutions. But it, it was an interesting time. And I earned a little bit more money doing music engraving uh, and working on the, uh, this complete works of Sylvius Weiss, which in, it, it consists, by the way, of uh, over 650 pieces for the lute, uh, 650 different pieces. I mean, some of them in many copies from different places. So it's a big corpus, uh, and that, that's quite interesting. I have to admit, however, that... Um, that very little of this is actually in the digital domain because I was working in a, uh, at a time when uh, you know it wasn't really very practical to uh, to, to have um, digital copies. I've got MIDI files for most of them, but uh, they're not very good ones. And uh, what well, I would like to go back and digitize these properly sometime. It's a it's a something I might get around to. Uh, through that group of um, like-minded colleagues, uh, I got involved in this thing which uh, is it's a kind of um, cross-disciplinary discipline called music information retrieval. What does it mean? Well, to me, it means how to find musical information within a corpus. And it's something like the function of a music librarian. That's not the same as what other people think of as music information retrieval. Um, to the music industry, uh, which has kind of exploded uh, in, in terms of this kind of thing, it's how to make music more easily accessible to those who want to enjoy it and are prepared to pay for it. So you, you can see that there are different drivers behind a common endeavor, um, but of course this last uh, incentive is a very strong one, and it has tended to mean that um, the, uh, the rec reconciling of these motivations is a tricky thing. Um, and this ISMIR, the International Society, or, well, International Symposium on Music Information Retrieval, which started in 2000, <coughs> excuse me, um, has tended uh, over the years, it's become the International Society, by the way, and, and uh, it was initially funded by the uh, National Science Foundation, oh, sorry, it's NSF, isn't it, in association with the US-UK research project, called, which uh, I wrote the proposal for, called Online Music Recognition and Searching. Um, the, uh, it, it was started by a bunch of us um, working with music librarians um, and uh, musicologists, and at that first conference, there were a whole bunch of people from MIT came along and kind of blew our minds with all this amazing work that was going on in, in audio, which we really didn't know much about, to be honest. Um, so our second version of this, this project, which was taken over by other people, um, uh, but I was closely associated with, um, added, uh, it w was actually focused rather strongly around audio plus semantics. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about uh, semantics either. I'm not going to go into detail about audio for that matter. But uh, those of you who know what it means will, will know what it means. Um, this may, these schematics which are coming might give you some idea of what I mean. Um, ideally, data, from data you can get information. And from information, eventually, when you 
collect enough of it. You can get knowledge. That's a, that's a rather naive um, view, but I think it's, it's not unrealistic. Um, in reality, uh, data, you extract and analyze some features, and feature one will give you a set of information one, feature two will give you information three, two, <laughs> information, feature three will give you information three, and these are all slightly different. Um, and you, but you hope that some contribution is made by each of these to the overall knowledge that you acquire, uh, or not. And uh, uh, I think this rather weird, um, uh, I'm going to, going to call it a roadmap, but it's nothing like a roadmap. It's kind of just, it's a, it's a warning really, that you can, ch you can easily be misled by pieces of information that are extracted in this way from uh, a complex uh, surface like uh, a musical signal. Um, but for disciplines like musical, uh, musicology, uh, external context, that is, things that aren't intrinsic to the music, are almost as important. And in fact, in, in a lot of musicological discourse, they're, they're more important than the content itself. Um, so it, it, it gets, gets a bit more subtle here. You have the same thing. So my, my saying that by adding external contexts, and you can use semantic uh, link data, semantic web, and all those kinds of technologies to provide this in principle, uh, will lead you something near to nearer to knowledge. Of course, knowledge is a re relative thing. Everybody has different knowledge. There is no absolute unique um, thing which is the knowledge of a certain thing. <laughs> okay, uh, so in a few, we've just come to the end of a funding round um, for uh, a, a large project called uh, transforming musicology, which is a very misleading title, uh, and I, I, I think the title helped us get the grant, but I'm not sure that it's one that I want it to be remembered for, because it implies that we have transformed musicology. What it was about was the process whereby tr musicology is willy-nilly, without any intention involved, is being transformed, just as the music industry, the music profession has been transformed by digital um, technology. Um, and so it's a large grant, two million pounds is a lot of money for a UK grant, especially in the arts and humanities, um, involving uh, f former colleagues uh, at Queen Mary, um, the eScience Centre at Oxford, uh, Utrecht University and Lancaster University, um, to explore the ways in which existing MIR tools, modified as necessary, can be of use to musicologists. That's the main thing. And the e-research center at Oxford devised a semantic framework for workflows, data, methods, results, and discourse around musicology. It's just a beginning, but it opens up, we think, some new paths for musicology, and we'll be releasing quite soon um, uh, quite a lot more um, work, which I don't want to go into now because it just would take up the rest of the, of the, the talk. Uh, so th the idea is that with semantics in, the, uh, in, in this uh, um, process, we can, we can do something which gets nearer to knowledge in the central. Now I want to give you an idea of what I mean by um, external context. This is, if you like, this is an extreme example. Um, and there's, there's no way in which present digital resources could help solve this problem. But the, the Dvorak Cello Concerto opens like this, or something like this. The main thing is a bit loud.
Okay. Now, eventually, the cello enters. I want you to think about the way it's being performed. The slow movement starts, uh, oh, there's a passage from it. And the end of the piece. Now, it would be fairly obvious that that was a rather special performance. I, I only picked out a few examples, um, and I want to give you some idea of why it was so special. Uh, let's hear the beginning. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Julie. No? It's August the 21st, 1968. That evening, Rostropovich at the BBC Proms with the USSR State Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Yevgeny Svetlanov. Earlier in the day, the Russian army had invaded Czechoslovakia to put an end to Dubček's Prague Spring. At the end of the concerto, Rostropovich stood and held up the conductor's score. There is somewhere a photograph of him doing that, but I couldn't find it on the web, as a gesture of solidarity for the composer's homeland and the city of Prague, a place he loved. And that recording captures that. And I played it, of course, out of sequence. You, 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 if you hear the entire recording, it is a BBC recording which is, which is uh, available on CD. Um, but uh, you know, for a start, you, you have the, the, at the very beginning, uh, the, the audience clap when, when the artists come onto the stage. And a group of protesters shout, freedom for Czechoslovakia, and the rest of the audience shut, it, shut them up uh, because they know something about Rostropovich, you know, that he didn't support that. However, it's very interesting, I was looking on the web for more information about this concert, and because uh, I remember this very clearly, it was, it was hot news in the UK at the time, I mean, you know, th this was really, I wasn't actually there, but I know people who were. And um, uh, it, it, it's funny how it, you know, there's an internet source which says, London was consumed all day with the harsh news, this is true, that, L that Russia had invaded Czechoslovakia to end the Prague Spring. There were demonstrations outside the venue, that's true, and heckling as the Soviet state symphony orchestra took the stage, there was a little bit. Um, the noise rivaled that of the last night of the proms. I, uh, you, probably know about the last night of the proms, but it was booing. That's just not true. The great Russian cellist walked into this storm of disapproval, eyed the irate audience, waited, and then slowly lifted his bow. 
When, the, when the, sound, the noise subsided to a few spasmodic processes, he lowered his bow and held up what he explained was the conductor's score for the work. He didn't do that. He did that at the end of the performance. He was much more subtle. <laughs> he didn't lecture the audience. He didn't tell them, let's, let's play this concerto. He might, this is what he implied just by holding up the score. Uh, and it's extraordinary how, you know, you'd read this on a website and you'd think that this was the sequence of events. Uh, furthermore, it goes on. He settled himself behind the cello before a completely silent audience, nodded at the orchestra, <laughs> and so began performances. There are a few pieces in the classical repertoire which build up to such a tense climax. Well, that's, you know, that's pretty true. And on this occasion, Rostropovich, who was also conductor, no, he wasn't. Svetlana was the conductor. Controlled the performance with almost unbearable poignancy. When it ended, he stood, shook the leader of the orchestra's hand, and left the stage. Rostropovich returned. Now, this is the, <laughs> this is the giveaway bit. To conduct the Bach Saraband Number no. Four. Uh, are Bach's Sarabands numbered? No. Which he said he offered to those who were sad. When it ended, it presumably being the Saraband, there was cheering and some suppressed sobbing as the orchestra filed out after him. The audience left in the orderly fashion of the English. There was only murmur murmuring and the shuffling of feet from those who had witnessed an elegy for a country's soul. Of course, this is romantic twaddle. Um, he, he was a conductor, and I... I, he wasn't the conductor, and I suspect this is a translation from a Slavic language where you don't have articles, you don't have A and the, and it's characteristic of translations um, from Slavic languages that they get confused, and I think he probably was a conductor. And similarly, t t to conduct the Bach Saraband number four is almost certainly the Saraband from Bach's fourth suite, which he frequently, and cellists, Casals used to, it's, it is a very sad piece, and it's a very, very common thing. And, and he, I, I, I'm pretty sure, I, of course, false memory might be here, but I'm pretty sure I listened to this on the radio, and I'm pretty sure he did play the Saraband at the, in the Bucks. And the stuff about the orderly fashion of the English, well, I can't tolerate that. <laughs> anyway, the point is, that is something full of error. Um, and... Uh, that recording you listen to is full of error. It's full of you know, slips of um, not quite togetherness and so on. But it's a great performance nonetheless. And it's great music making. And it communicates everything that Dvorak wanted to communicate. It communicates what Rostropovich wanted to communicate. And Svetlanov, I don't know much about his attitude. But it's quite clear when you listen to the whole thing, <sighs> perhaps I'm being... A, a, romantic about this myself, but I get the impression there's solidarity from this orchestra. They're artists. They're not politicians. But they are true communists, of course. They wouldn't have got the jobs if they weren't. But they wouldn't have approved of the evasion, invasion of Czechoslovakia, which was which a barbarous act, and, and everybody admits that. These things all represent, in a way, if you look at them, as a, a kind of error. Uh, and I believe that rec recognize the inevitability of error is not to admit failure. That, that it's very easy for, for people to assume that the only thing that matters is eliminating error. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's not true at all, I think. So we have to find ways of coping with error. And I'm going to give you a few examples, I think, in the, uh, in the next uh, part of the um, presentation. I'm going to look at audio search, and I'm going to do, uh, deal with some clear modern recordings, um, looking at how we might look for light, uh, Wagner's light motifs in, uh, in uh, recordings, um, look at some lute music, uh, and I'm also going to look at some historical recordings uh, from the... Oh, sorry, <laughs> Charlie Parker's crept in there. I didn't get it to work, so... Um, uh, but the King Sound Archive, which was a collection of um, 78 RPM recordings, which has been digitized. Uh, just forget you ever saw Charlie Parker there. I, I did do um, uh, some work on trying to recognize riffs played by Charlie Parker in the audio. And this was using a collection of pretty well all his 
recordings. And of course, th these have been issued on CD. Um, the quality of those recordings, of course, was pretty terrible, mostly, because they're live performances done um, uh, on very crude equipment. I mean, we're talking about the, the 1940s here, uh, so there would be um, not even tape recordings uh, there before that. Um, I'm not absolutely sure what technology was used, but um, anyway. And the other thing I want to look at is music prints and uh, finding the same music on another page. And I'll explain this when we come to the... That's the end of that part of the presentation. So now I'm going to have to put my glasses on for the rest. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, okay, let's, let's do this. I'm sorry about the... Um, this is always difficult. I've got a... Um, this is something I've kind of lashed up. Um, in fact, I'm starting in the wrong place. I should have started there. Right. Okay. Um, I've got a bit... Uh, here I'll read. O audio signals al always, by their very nature, contain what engineers call noise. To match the music in mu audio signals, the noise is everything else than the music. And as we have to use... And so we have to use methods that are, as far as possible, immune to the effects of this noise. We can't just remove it. Uh, we extract features from the overall signal that represent some meaningful aspect of the music and perform our matching on them. Note that we do not, or we can't, match the music itself directly. The features we extract are, of course, affected by noise, which is sometimes hard to distinguish from the music. Think of a percussion instrument like the side drum. I mean, how can you... You can't actually, in, uh, the, the, the actual sound is both noise to an engineer and music. Uh, the, 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 it's basically, the, the music is in the blocks of noise, if you like. So we are forced to use approximate matching methods that give us the best imperfect meth matches rather than identical ones. This, there's nothing revolutionary about this. Everybody knows this who, who's tried to do it. It's not a bad thing, though, even though it adds to the computation, computational cost, as musical entities hardly ever match exactly in any case, especially in real performances. Um, two performances of the same work obviously are going to sound slightly different. Um, a repetition by the same performer will always sound slightly different. It, it, it can't be avoided. You, you, you cannot exactly reproduce what you what you played previously. Um, it's different with um, uh, computer-driven performances, of course, where you can reproduce exactly. Um, so we can use things like the well-known chroma feature, um, which are basically distributions of energy in the signal over the 12 chromatic pitch classes, ignoring their octave, the, the octave of the notes, and match sequences of them. There are many subtle ways of extracting these chromas, but they share the desirable quality that they are more or less in, invariant to timbre. Sorry, my screensaver has come on with just an inappropriate moment. So that music played on an oboe or violin might be matched with the same music sung or played on another instrument. Um, let me just um, demonstrate what I mean. Uh, I'm going... Okay. Um, this is... Basically, I'm searching for leitmotifs, if you don't know what they are, ask me later, um, in a, a, a recording of all 15 hours of um, Wagner's Ring Cycle, which is four operas. Uh, and I'm going to... Set, well, let, let's, let's play... I'm going to set it searching while you're... Okay, um, and we can find in the opera. Okay, so it can be done. This, this, this is the second. Match, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so far, so so simple. That's it's fairly obvious that that's that's going to be closely matched with that MIDI extract that you that you heard. Um, if I go back and choose another one of these motives, the one that this that, that by the way represents a curse that Alberich um, uh, declares. Um, I don't don't want to go into the plot, but um, it's 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 a very powerful uh, emotional. Uh, theme which comes back uh, many times in the opera. Um, sorry, let me juggle with my glasses here. Uh, here's a very um, salient type of. Oh, sorry, I didn't click on it properly. That's uh, one of the most famous um, Wagnerian motifs. Um, it's, it's called the sword. Uh, and uh, let's try looking for transposed versions of this. Um, it shouldn't take too long. Well, 15 hours of music it's searching, or at least um, extract. Uh, so, the first one, let's hope. Oh, and by the way, um, the query to that system was literally what you heard here. So it's got no accompaniment. Oh, so, sorry about the balance, but you, you heard it earlier. Um, okay, in Goethe Dameron, this one I think is a false positive. Yes, because what essentially the chroma feature finds is a triad, a major triad. Uh, so um, that was another example. That is, in fact, a recurrence of another theme. Uh, but the, th the, th the third one, which is at a different pitch again. Played on the oboe there. Um, so so uh, th that, that's an example of one, one kind of thing, which I think, uh, in principle, could be useful for musicologists. Um, now, ret returning to my special field, or one might say my comfort zone of lute music, uh, queries for modern recordings can be fairly easily matched. Let me demonstrate that with a, um, a little uh, sort of demo thing that I've done here. If, if we take The Frog Galliard by John Dowland, which sounds like this. Okay, um, if I just select a region of that, um, let's just take it. Which one? Okay, and I can search for that in a database. And, okay, it finds the identical match, and it finds a, a terrible recording. Uh, but it, uh, it's more interesting, actually, to look at... Uh, sorry, uh, go back and choose the same thing again. More or less, and look at transposed versions of this, because uh, we'll find and actually, I wanted to uh, just show you that um, there is a possibility of oh sorry, here we are. Um, this is, oh, this is a, a, a recording of uh, music by Sylvius Leopold Weiss by a, um, a Quebecois lutenist called Michel Cardin, um, who uh, is kind of a local person, uh, 
And if we do a search within the set, we, we come across in my collection of 80 odd CDs. Now this is a passacaglia uh, in, where the same harmony repeats. And uh, it's quite interesting that um, sometimes different sections of the piece match the query differently. Uh, this is played on the guitar. And I've even got a version, well, this is on the Lautenwerk, which is a gut-strung harpsichord. And uh, finally, somewhere there, oh, unfortunately, I've got a version played on the piano, which um, is quite, quite interesting. But um, there's another thing, of course, we can do. We can look, for instance, at some random section and see where it appears again in the same file. And there it is, and here it is. So, this is, I, I think this kind of interface which, which enables you to visualize the music. Oh, sorry, I, I should have explained that uh, the, obviously the, uh, the, the sort of ribbon that you're seeing there is a spectrogram of the, of the, uh, the whole recording, which gives you some idea of how to navigate it. Um, uh, uh, if we can cover that. Now, with historical recordings, we, we encounter a different problem. Um, even if they're digitized faithfully without fancy, fancy processing from the original 78 RPM discs, well, in, in fact, especially when they, they haven't been processed with noise reduction techniques and so on, we have a lot of very obvious noise present in the signal. Uh, surface noise is heard as a continuous hiss throughout each side of a disc, and it probably will be pretty unpleasant for you to listen to some of these things. But again, um, chroma features work quite well. Um, if I um, select the composer, you will see that I've pre-selected a composer here. This is uh, music by uh, Mozart in this collection, and, well, let's play a bit of this. Okay, if we, if we select um, just that bit and look, yeah, of course, here we go, demo effect, no, they're good. I'm happy to say that the next match is another recording, but notice, uh, again, it's, it's found the, um, the repetition rather than the original, and the, the, uh, the opening which I selected in the other case. Um, so those um, kinds of matches are certainly possible. Uh, finally, I want to look at a completely uh, different um, retrieval task um, where we have to find a, a matching method that's, as in the same way, we have to find a matching method that's, as far as possible, robust to error. Um, in this case, our starting point and here we come back to early music and historical musicology, is images of pages of printed music. In this case, all printed before 1600 in the British Library's Early Music Online collection. Here, um, I'll try and just e enlarge this so that you can see it better. Um, 
I've got here a, a page um, which shows you this. Um, it's, it's not very clear, but the music notation is pretty much as modern music notation with some slight differences. Um, and uh, what we're doing is trying to find out where music on a page selected by a user might be found elsewhere in the collection. Uh, the Early Music Online collection consists of 300 books of music printed before 1600, um, digitized from microfilms. Um, the total number of pages is around 32,000. It's over to 32,000. And the number of notes is just under 4 million. Um, and much of this music is by the most famous composers of the age. So coincidences, coincidences of that sort, where um, a, 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 a page of music uh, occurs in two different books uh, are actually quite common. Um, and what I've done here is um, set it up so that it's, you're looking at a, um, a very famous uh, madrigal by uh, a composer called Arkadelt, uh, and we can just try searching for that. Let's see what happens. Okay, so our first one is Oh, of course, it's not going to appear now. Okay. Oh, I know why. It's because... Yeah, okay. I knew this would go wrong. There we are. So that's the page we were searching for. Uh, and this is our first hit. This is another edition of the same piece. And then there's another. And then there's another, I think. Oh, no, that's a different piece. But it has con contains a lot of the same uh, ideas. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. Um, you'll see here, at, at, the, at the top here, there's a... A, a code written out. Uh, it's a very, very simple one. That that uh, what we what we've done here is extract from uh, the output of a optical music recognition program called Arispix, which was partly developed here by Laurent Pujan with, together with uh, Ichiro Fujinaga. Um, and uh, the uh, this outputs the music, but there are quite a lot of errors. Um, in optical recognition, and this is a, a common um, fact uh, that, that uh, m optical music recognition is an extremely difficult problem and is by no means solved. So we have to find ways of dealing with errors. So what we do is we extract, uh, we have a code for the intervals uh, between the notes, um, where when the music goes down, uh, it's lower case, when it goes up, it's upper case, and the uh, and in fact, in this case, what we're, what we're recording is the diatonic intervals, that is between pitch names rather than between uh, semitones. Um, and when it goes up, it's, it's um, uppercase, and um, hyphens mean it's the same note. So, so uh, we, we just concatenate the whole output of a page into a string, and then we extract n-grams from that, and we just count the number of times those n-grams, the, the, those short snippets uh, from, from the, the complete piece, appear on other pages in the book. And it seems to work extremely well for, for finding um, pieces which contain the same music. We could, of course, use um, image comparison techniques, but they're easily fooled, and I've tried this by the layout of the page and uh, things like uh, decorative initials. That the, the example I showed you there doesn't contain uh, decorative initials, but um, uh, if you have those, it, it, it's image recognition um, software tends to, to latch on to anything big and um, elaborate and, and say, oh, that's the same as that. Of course, printers use these things uh, multiple times. They, they didn't just use them uniquely on one page of music. So, so where, um, where uh, a, um, an, an initial appears um, d doesn't mean that the 
the music's going to be related to that initial in any way at all. Um, uh, oh, and anybody who's used Google Images will, will know what I mean, because if you try and look for music at that, you, uh, you'll, you'll get very confused. Um, so we need to mu use the musical information uh, in the way that I've uh, described. Um, anyway, uh, just wanted to try one more match, because this is an exam another example of the kind of thing which is made uh, possible by this, if I can just go down to this. is a, a possibly the worst interface in the world, but um, it's... Uh, yeah. Those of you who are proper web designers will will know in what ways it's bad. Um, zero, okay, show that. This is um, a a rather interesting example. This is a book of madrigals which are translated from Italian into English. So this is a, a, a madrigal by Luca Marenzio, it says up there, um, with English words, I must depart all hapless. Uh, and of course, Marenzio was a very famous composer and of course his madrigals appear, uh, let's hope. Yes, so it sh it shows uh, the the very piece that we've searched for there. Uh, the, the first match, the second match, however, is I hope yes. This is in fact Marenzio's "Io partiro ma il core," which is which is in fact exactly the same as as you'll see uh, if you compare them the music is the same. Uh, interestingly, I think, I hope that works, 153? Surely it, this is connecting to uh, a server at Goldsmiths, so there may be some delay. In the, that's my excuse. No, it's not going to work. I think I kind, I kind of know what's happened. Ah, maybe, okay. One nice thing about the, um, the uh, music encoding initiative, uh, the MEI uh, uh, system that, that's being used, format that's being used to, rec oh, there we are, it eventually has found. This is the Quintus part, that's another part of the same piece. Uh, another voice part, I mean, uh, and uh, it, it has very much the same musical content, uh, which explains well, in, uh, it, why it's found. So, so you can see, if you look at the um, opening uh, melody, you'll see it's pretty well identical. Um, okay, uh, so there's one more thing I wanted to show you, that uh, one of the things we can do is to overlay on it what the um, optical music recognition system has recognized. And you'll see, for instance, um, it's quite a nice example here of where the optical recognition has gone wrong on this, this line is uh, a third out. And the reason for that is that it's failed to recognize the clef at the beginning of the line. I, 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 could possibly show you, yes, if I click here. You see, you'll see that the first, second, and third lines of music, it's recognized a clef at the beginning. The fourth one, it's just recognized that as a sharp sign. Um, and this software defaults to a soprano clef, which is um, a, a C on the bottom line. So it actually comes out a third uh, lower. Uh, which explains why those notes are at the wrong pitch. So that's another reason for using this n-gram technique, where which um, which allows us because there's only the, the only place where there's a, um, a an error in the intervals uh, is between the end of the third line of music and the and the beginning of the fourth line of music, which is uh, quite satisfactory. So n-grams that don't actually include those notes will be similar. Um, Okay, 
Ultimately, uh, I hope that methods such as those I've been showing you um, can form the basis for tools which are genuinely useful, as these are not really, for musicologists. But I want to emphasize this is really just the beginning of this process. Thank you very much. <laughs>